Hello everyone, it's time to start post-processing our pictures and this is sort of the part that I'm going to enjoy more is actually getting a model. So I'm going to go ahead and grab all the pictures that I want, which is everything except for my uh, back picture because I don't really need that right now. So I'll drag these into Photoshop and you have to give Photoshop a second. It's opening all of these pictures in camera raw and we'll go ahead and process these. Okay, so the perfect picture to have at first is this white card picture. And I've got my white balance right here. It's the first thing in the basics. So we just click on the eyedropper and I'm gonna click this little white swatch right here and that will set the white balance. I didn't see any chance So, Oh, you know why? Um, I had done this earlier, so it actually is reading my old data. Let's go ahead and see if we can reset this to as shot. That's what it looked like. And then when we click on this, it changes the white balance. So you can see that now. Okay, so uh, now that we have that set up, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to up the exposure. It was a little bit like one under, so I'm gonna go ahead and just put in one and see what that looks like. That looks really good. So that's about where we should be. We have, like I said, we have a little latitude with these Sony full frame sensors. They're pretty good. So you can go ahead and just up the exposure a little bit. Uh, and then, after I'm done with that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drop the highlights. Let's see what happens if I drop it all the way down like so. And I'm going to up the shadows all the way up and see what that looks like. OK, so what I was hoping for was to drop out some of this, uh, these shadows that we were getting from the lights. It's not doing a lot for me, um, so I'm just going to have to deal with it the way it is. There are some other methods to de-shadow stuff, but we could actually do that afterwards. Uh, but let's just get through this and not worry about that too much right now. Um, I do this typically, the dropping of the highlights and the raising the shadows all the time anyway, because what you want to get from your diffuse uh, color is more of a flat diffuse color that doesn't have any peaks or, or shadows. You want it to be almost like as if it was in this some kind of weird sterile white environment. Um, which doesn't really exist, but you know, well, I guess you could make it, but it'd be hard to do. Um, so, but typically what I usually set this at is like negative 60 and like I'll do positive 60 on this side. Now I typically use a different program, uh, for my post-processing. I use a program called DxO Photo Lab. And one of the reasons why I like DxO better than Photoshop for this is that it allows me to push the highlights and shadows way further than Photoshop does. So I can actually um, get rid of more of that shadow or get more of the get rid of more of the highlights. But uh, most people have access to Photoshop, which works okay. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you could go ahead and try dropping the white, say, to 25 or so. And then you could raise the blacks if you want to 25 as well. So basically what we're doing again is we're flattening out the uh, color. It will still have a ton of the details in there that will allow the photograms to happen, but it gets rid of uh, some of the, you know, some of that color so we get a better diffuse texture. Um, now you have these textures, clarity, dehaze. I actually like to go into here and I don't put much into here, maybe just like three. Try that again, three. And if I go ahead and zoom into this, let me drop the white balance and zoom in uh, and I'll put it back down to zero. You don't really see much of a difference, but what it does is just add a tiny bit of micro contrast. I don't want to add too much because I don't want it to get too uh, muddy when we start making this uh, as a 3D model. Uh, and I'm going to do the same thing with the clarity, just add a tiny bit. And the same thing with the is just just a tiny, tiny bit. It just gets micro contrast in there and that can be good for the details, but you don't want to go too far with this. If you're doing skin tones, you actually don't want that micro contrast. So if you're doing someone's face, leave that stuff uh, at its base. And sometimes you even want to drop some, some contrast uh, because otherwise the skin will look real weird and bubbly. Um, other than that, uh, let's go into the details. Let's see here. So we could turn on a noise reduction. Um, my ISO, you know, there you don't really see much noise in here, but we can go ahead and zoom in. There is a little bit. And so we can turn this denoise on and see how it does. It's gonna, it's running through a process on the other screen. Here's the bar. 
So we'll see what that looks like after it's done. And wait for it. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and just turn this all the way up and see what it looks like. So um, looking at this, it looks a little bit blurry. So I think I'm just going to take it back down to where it was and just hit enhance. And then we'll go ahead and look at it again. It's not much different, but it'll get rid of a little bit of noise. Uh, the optics, we don't want to mess with the optics as far as fixing the uh, geometry of the lens. Um, and that's actually up here, it says use profile correction. Do not do that. AggieSoft wants the original profile from the camera, so you don't want that. But you can remove the chromatic aberration. There's probably not much. You can do um, defringing if you want. That's fine. There's not really anything to defringe, so I'm not going to worry about it right now. Uh, we don't need to worry about any of these other things in here. We're actually basically done. So since the rest of the pictures were all taken with the same settings, all we have to do now is come down to here. I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to say copy edit settings. And then I'll hit control A. That'll select everything. And then we'll right click again and say paste edit settings. And what it'll do is it'll fix all the pictures up just like that. And now they're ready to export. Now I'm not going to export these with the chip chart. I'm just going to, I don't know why there's two of them now. I don't know if I accidentally made a virtual copy or something. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and just export all of these like so and then all you have to do is you can just right click or it actually has the export button right here so you can just hit this and it's going to ask where you want to export it to now i always export as jpegs uh, some people are purists and they might do tips or something like that i've done comparisons and i can't seem to find any visible difference between a jpeg and a tiff and the jpegs are much much smaller size so they take up much less space in your hard drive um, and trust me, I've done this a lot. So I used to always use the, the higher quality. And after I started using JPEG, I didn't see any difference. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, select my folder. And it looks like it has it right here. So this is the right place. This is fine. Actually, you know what? Let me put it in my photogrammetry folder so I don't get lost. Uh, we'll go into photogrammetry, sculpture, uh, Brazilian bas relief. And then what I'll do is put in JPEG 2, uh, because I already did this once before, and we'll just say select. And then make sure that you're set to the quality of uh, 12, which is the maximum quality you can get. Uh, and that should be it. Uh, as long as everything's at default, we should be good. And then we just go ahead and say save. And bar down here, it's going to go ahead and export these. Uh, they're large files, so it can take a long time to export. So we'll just pause, and once it's done, we'll come back and start playing in AggieSoft. Okay, Photoshop is done with doing its thing. I can come back over, and if I want, I can hit done. It's going to save these little XML files out that save all my settings into it. So if I ever need to um, get those settings again, I can always open it back up, and all the settings would be stored in there. And then we can go ahead and then just minimize Photoshop. And here's AggieSoft. So I'm gonna walk you through everything and try to get through this as fast as possible. I don't wanna go through every little tidbit of the program yet uh, because it's not really necessary to just get a scan out. But let me go ahead and get the pictures in here and we can start moving. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just grab all my photos. There's 115 pictures. I'll just hit control A, select them all, and then I'm gonna drag them over to this thing that says chunk one. And just drag them right there and let go. And I'll minimize that. And you can see all the pictures will come in here pretty fast. And what we're gonna first do is we're gonna go through the pictures that I need to flip because we could flip them in AggieSoft. It's the easiest way to do it. So as they come in, let's see here, there's a lot of them. Okay, so the camera, because I was turning to the side, it automatically rotated these pictures. 
And these are the kind of things that we'll want to rotate back so that Aggiesoft knows the orientation. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit that. It'll rotate it back. You can see now it knows. We come over here. This is the other side. And we'll rotate it the other direction. Same thing. And those look like they're all right. Now here's where we get to the upside down pictures. And this will just help the software figure everything out faster if we just rotate it 180 degrees like so. And these, let's see here. That's probably the best way to do it. Like so. Uh, we'll leave that one like that. And this one should go like that. Yep, that's it. So, oh. Looks like I missed a few. There we go. Just going to double check my work. Yeah, somehow I missed these. There we go. That looks right. This one's a little tricky. So right in the corner. Yeah, it should be like this. Now, a lot of times I'm scanning and I don't need to do this, but uh, I know that we'll get better results if we do this. Okay, that's just great. Okay, so easiest thing to do is come to Align Photos immediately. All right, let me explain a few settings in here. Um, if you have this set to highest, it's gonna take the full resolution of the actual picture. And it might take a little bit longer, but I usually use the highest to do my, my work, but it may depend on how fast your computer is. If you use something like high, what it does is it makes the picture like a quarter of the size. Now, if you're working with like a cell phone or something that only has 12 megapixels, uh, which nowadays, like the most of the iPhones have 12, 12 megapixels in most of their modes, some of the cameras, if you have like a Pro Max, I think it has 16 on the wide angle, but uh, if you have a lower megapixel, you definitely want to use the highest. Um, if you have something like this at this level, I could definitely use the high and get by with it, but I'm still going to leave it at highest. And then I change these key point limits and tie point limits to a pretty high level. Now, again, the default level that this comes in, which I don't remember at the moment, uh, it's like, so one of them is like 10,000 and 40,000 or something like that. I, I'm not, I don't even remember, but uh, the default levels actually are fine. It's just gonna give you a lot less points that it's gonna work with. So I, I usually try to up this a little bit, but again, if you have a slower computer, it might take a long time if you're building that many points. But once you have this set, all you have to do is hit okay. Now we're gonna wait for a little while because this thing has to go through the process of uh, looking at all these photos and matching different contrast points that it finds is the same, and then align, aligning all of these so that they're basically in 3D space, making up a point cloud. And then from there, we actually build the depth maps and the um, we'll be building the 3D model from the depth maps. So now it's just a little bit of a waiting game. Go get a cup of coffee or whatever, come back and check it, check it later. This part is not the longest part. The longest part is usually doing the depth maps and making the model. So, um, you know, you may want to come back. If you have a slower computer, maybe it's going to take a half hour. Um, for me, it'll probably take about 10 minutes because I have a pretty fast machine. All right, so we've got our results here. And let's go ahead and look at this. Let me tell you how to navigate first. Uh, there's this little pointer here that says navigation. And there's like this little ball and you just click on the ball and pull on it to rotate. Now, if the ball is not the center of your object, you can just double click on your object and actually it moves the object 
it doesn't really move the object, but it moves like the navigation and the object. So they're kind of in the same space in the center. So I can move it over here if I want or move it back to the center. And then I can move around here. Now I'm going to pull this down so I can see more. And I'm going to use my mouse wheel to scroll in and out. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just take a look at the results that we have here. Now, there's not a lot of information around here. Uh, however, uh, when I look at my images here, it says uh, 115 out of 115 are aligned. So there wasn't any images that didn't align. So there's got to be some information that'll come out of here. Hopefully it will turn out good, but it looks kind of barren in there. And usually I like to get, you know, a nice even amount all the way through. Uh, however, you know, these areas will have more information because we took more pictures of it. So um, just rotating around, you can see, you know, all of these, these different, uh, these different points. These are made up of the, you know, from the pictures of the contrast points. So let's go ahead and look at the cameras. So I'm going to go ahead and press this little camera button here and zoom out a little bit. And you can see that all these are showing where the cameras were. And I wanted to point out that you can see how I have the first set is up here where I went flat all the way across the surface. And then I gradually moved a little bit over and then a little bit over and angled it uh, a little bit at a time. I didn't go uh, super far. I didn't jump from up here to over here because the software would never figure out all the different points uh, without these uh, in the center section. So you kind of got to go a little step at a time. Okay, so that's important to understand. And you have kind of the same thing here on the side. And since we know that everything aligned, we know that, you know, we gave it enough information to build out the point cloud that it has. So um, the next thing I want to do after rotating, sorry, I got a fly in here. <laughs> the next thing we want to do after rotating this and looking at it is to uh, set this up so it's actually oriented how it was in the world. Uh, and that's just going to help us uh, do everything else. So um, what I'm going to do then is uh, I'm going to set it up so it's at the center point. Now, I don't think I mentioned how to pan, and that's just the middle mouse drag. So if I click down my middle mouse and drag, you can pan. And like I showed you already, the rotation and then zoom is uh, the scrolling the mouse wheel. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up this right in the center and facing upwards. So what we want to do is we want to change the perspective view to orthographics. I'm going to hit five on my keyboard. Now it's in orthographic mode. And then I'm going to use this tool right here. Uh, you can see there's a, a move, scale, rotate, and then you can reset or update. But I'm going to go ahead and use the rotate object. So I'm going to do that. And now uh, I'm going to hit one on my keyboard, and that's the orthographic top view. And so now that I have that, I can go ahead and start rotating this so that it looks like it's facing me and I'm going to try to straighten up these lines a little bit. That looks pretty good. We can come back to that if it's not just right. And I'm going to go to move objects and then I'm going to move this over to this center point here. So that's about the center of the object. Now, if I hit two on my keyboard, you can see it does this like rotation around the object. So you can kind of see how you're set up. If you hit three, it'll go ahead and look at it from a side view. We're looking down the X axis right here. Um, and you can see that we're not rotated completely perfect and moved completely perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and use the move tool and move it up just a little bit like that or so and leave it there. Uh, if I hit six on my keyboard, it rotates around as well. Seven will uh, go into another orthographic looking down the Z direction and four rotates around that, the Y. So you have all these different directions you can look at this at. Uh, so looking at it from here, you can see this looks set up pretty good. All right, so now uh, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm actually going to uh, create a bounding box that just envelops the stuff that we want. So what we're gonna do is basically limit how much the computer is actually gonna build and that will give us better quality because all the resources will be uh, will be focused on just the stuff that we want. So that's this next box over here. And I'm going to go to resize region. We might have to do rotate region first. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, we'll have to do rotate region first because the, the 
region rotation is a little bit off. So I'm going to go ahead and just rotate on the red a little bit. And what I'm looking at here is I'm trying to get these lines so that they're all aligned. That's why we're in orthographic view, because if we were in perspective, you wouldn't be able to see this too well. And let's rotate the Y a little bit. And that looks really good. It looks like a pretty solid line, which means that we're looking at it uh, almost straight down uh, from the top view. So if I went to the uh, side view here, you can see that looks pretty good too. Let's go back to the top. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to clamp that area down. So I'm going to go to resize region. And there's these little blue tick marks that are in the corners. And you just click on one of those and you drag it. And so I can drag it over here like this, drag this side over here like this, and drag this up a little bit like so. And then we can go to that side view like so. And then we can go and drag this in closer, making sure we don't clip into the actual object where we see the main information. And that looks pretty good. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. Because I'm going, I'm trying to avoid getting this white area here because I don't think that's what I want. But I also don't want to clip into my object. Now, if I middle mouse uh, click and drag, I can go ahead and pan over and look closer over here, and that's pretty good. You can see it's not perfectly aligned, but I don't worry about making it perfect. Just getting it really close is enough, and that looks pretty good. So let's go to seven. Look at it from this way. That looks pretty good. Let's go back to one. And then I'll hit five on my keyboard and get back into my perspective. And then I'll go back to my rotate tool and I'll just look around like this and then bring this box back up and just see what it looks like. That looks good. So I think we're going to be fine with that. And now when it builds, it's only going to build what's within that box. All this extra stuff will be eliminated. Uh, if you need to, some people like to delete out the extra points out here like so. So you just click on this selection tool and you would just drag and let's do this one more time. We'll drag like that and then you can just hit this X right here and that will delete the extra information. But it's not really that necessary right now um, because we have the bounding box selecting exactly what we want. All right, we'll kill that. And so now you have just the inner area. And so, you know, these other areas uh, shouldn't affect it much, but uh, it won't matter, like I said. Um, okay, so the next thing we want to do is we're going to go ahead to the next step, which is to build the mesh. And you could build a point cloud first, or, uh, but they changed the workflow. You used to, used to have to build a, the point cloud first and then build the mesh, but they actually put them both into this one step here. Um, so usually I do it with depth maps on an occasion. I will change it to, um, the tie points, but most of the time I'm doing the depth maps and, um, it can take a lot longer if you do ultra high, uh, like again, if you have a really strong computer, you might want to do it that way. And then, um, but typically like how I would normally do it if, if I didn't have a strong computer is I might do these as quality as high and face count as high. Uh, me, I'm going to do the ultra high and I'm going to set this to a custom. And when you set this to zero, it'll be as high as the model can go without any decimation. Decimation is a way that uh, the computer crunches it. So you don't have the model so high poly um, because some computers can't handle it, but my computer can. So I'm going to go ahead and do ultra high and zero. And then I'll show you how to actually manually crunch it so that, you know, uh, if you want to do the high uh, and high, you know, you go ahead and do it that way and you'll see the results that you would get anyway, because I'll show you a decimation inside of here. Uh, we don't need to go into the advanced or anything, but we just hit OK. This is the part that's probably going to take the longest. It could take two hours. It could take four. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but I'm going to guess somewhere about an hour, maybe an hour and a half on my computer. Um, if you don't have a super fast computer or really high end graphics card, uh, it could take all night. So just be aware of that. So, um, you know, you have to be patient. So I hit OK. And then this is going to start up and it's going to kind of do a countdown. The countdown is not always accurate. So um, just kind of go out and get some coffee now. <laughs> all right. See you in a little bit. OK, here we go. We've got this thing finished. And wow, 
Look at this. It looks really good. 41 million faces. Now, admittedly, that's ridiculous for an object like this. But, hey, what the heck? If you can do it, do it. And you could bake out all the model information into maps and get a really nice uh, lower poly solution that you could use. So what's next? Well, we've got some white areas in here and I can go ahead and select those and try to delete those out. Uh, one way to do it is to go to the selection thing right here and uh, basically try to get just the areas that are white. It's going to take a second because there's so many polys that it takes a long time. Now to rotate, um, you have to basically switch to the uh, little pointer tool and that brings up this orbit ball. Um, but you can go ahead and select and get rid of this stuff. Now I did get some of the brown area. Let's see if we can do this a different way. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll turn back this direction zoom in here and I'll click off of this and then I'll get the freeform selection so I can do this and what I can do is with the freeform is I'll start here and you basically can go to the other end over here but try to get it just so the white is selected so now if I go in closer and look at this that looks pretty good. So I could delete all that, just hit the little X, or you can hit delete on your keyboard. And wait for it, there we go. So some of that's gone. Okay, there's another way to help. So if you don't wanna select all of these little pieces here, we can go into model gradual selection, and we have to wait a second. It takes a little bit to come up, especially if you have a heavy model. And we're gonna to go to connected component size, so what this uh, gradual selection does is that if I put this level to 99, it takes a second because it's such a big mesh. Okay, what this will do is it'll select every piece of the mesh that's not connected to the largest uh, mass of, of polygons. And I can hit OK. And so you can see all these little stragglers are going to be selected. And then I can just kill those because we don't need those. And then it'll take a second, there we go. And then we can come through here and you know we could just do another selection with this free form. Maybe go ahead and uh, I have a really annoying fly flying around my head. It is that time in summer, so they get in the barn. So I'm just gonna select this, this area right here. Make sure I don't have the stuff that I I do want and then just kill it and we have 9,000 selected okay so we come back to here and double click right there so I can rotate like this and you might be able to select more that way give it a second I'll delete that. That's 18,000 polygons or faces. And you can just go through and keep doing this. Uh, usually, if you have a piece like this, the easiest way is just to kind of do a marquee selection on the backside and just get rid of anything that's uh, that's falling like uh, in the white area. But it's not perfectly even, so that's why I'm kind of doing it individually like this. You do that. That's not going to select much, but it'll get a few. So wait for it. There we go. So what I was talking about is if I go to the marquee selection, uh, let's put it back to orthographic by hitting five. Uh, we'll go back to a side view by hitting three. Um, now I could actually probably fix this. I could probably go and just rotate the uh, model a little bit. So rotate object. And you can see the rotation is kind of like off kilter a little bit, which is not great. Um, 
But I'm thinking like if I do something like this, and if I was to take the selection marquee and kind of select everything like that. Now I know this isn't gonna be good, so I'm probably going to uh, not use this, but this is, you know, if it, if it was nice and straight and perfect, then, you know, this might be the best way to do it, wouldn't be to do something like this and then just delete it. But uh, I'll have to individually go through and clean this up like I was already showing, uh, but I won't bore you with that. So I'll just clean it up off camera and then come back. All right, so I've gone through, cleaned up all the edges, and now let's get to what is the next stage, which would be getting a model that we can export out that won't be so high poly. So I'm gonna go ahead and go up to my tools and go to mesh, and I'm gonna go decimate mesh. Now, I'm gonna pick a face count that I think is appropriate. This is a pretty simple model, actually, so I'm gonna just make this maybe like Oh, I don't know, maybe 20,000, which is still pretty high, but uh, it should give plenty of uh, plenty of latitude to have a decent uh, poly count to get some more detail. I'll hit OK. It's going to ask me to replace the default model. I'm going to say no. Do not replace the default model. We want the, uh, the original model. Otherwise, we have to rebuild the whole thing. We're going to actually bake the information from the high poly model down to the low poly model so that we can use that information in a different program. All right, after this is done, it's probably a good idea to save the file. So I'll do that right now. Okay, you can see this is what the uh, what the uh, decimated mesh will look like, and it has exactly 20,000 faces. Impressive. Save as, and we'll give this a name. Save it over that one. And depending on how big the model is, this can actually take a little bit. Okay, it moves your screen when you save. Not sure why, but it does. Okay, so now we got this uh, lower poly version. Let's go look at something really quick though. Let's look at the original. And I wanna show you a couple things you can look at. Okay, so um, really quick before we get away from the original one, uh, I want to show you what it would look like solid. Yours might look different than this because I have a different mat cap, which uh, is what they use to uh, look at the solid. Uh, I put in my own mat cap, and, uh, but it kind of lets you see the detail a little bit better. So you can see what we got going on here and all the grains and stuff like that. So uh, pretty cool. Uh, what else can you look at? Uh, eventually we'll be able to look at the textured. Um, you know, there's a wireframe in here, but that probably doesn't mean much when you have a 40 million poly uh, mesh because uh, it's gonna be so dense that you have to get this close to actually see through it. Um, that's pretty dense. So usually I'm looking at the shaded. This is actually what's called vertex colors. Uh, it's basically like each vertice, there's 20 million vertices, and is, a, is assigned a color based on the map uh, that hit that area. So um, it's really vertex colors, but you can actually project textures, and that's what we're going to do now. So what I'm going to actually do is um, I'm going to go ahead and go back to our decimated mesh. Let's get you. The fly is taunting me. Um, I'm going to go back to my decimated mesh and uh, I'm going to go to workflow and then I'm going to go to build texture. And in here, I'm going to build, I'm going to start off with a diffuse map. Uh, you can do it by images or you can bake it from the original. When I have a, well, let's do this. Let's do the images first. We'll see how it looks. Uh, sometimes uh, the baking from the original, when you have enough polygons, enough vertex color, actually can look better so uh or sometimes it bakes better let's put it that way um so we'll see what it looks like and if it looks really clean uh then we'll keep it if not we'll use the actual model to bake its vertex colors onto uh this this model now what's happening right now is 
Agisoft is laying out texture uh, or UV texture space for this object. If you don't know what UVs are, it's basically like the model flattened so you can put like an image on it. And uh, Agisoft will do that automatically. However, it's not really an optimized UV map, but it does work. You know, so uh, for this tutorial, we're just going to deal with the automated one. Uh, and maybe in future more advanced tutorials, we can go into how to lay it out by hand, uh, but not this time. So this could take a few minutes. And uh, because it's not only doing the texturing part, but it's actually doing the UV part. So it has to actually do two functions before you get your uh, results. But once it's done, it, the baking out the maps uh, doesn't take too long, except for the ambient occlusion map. Uh, which sometimes can take a while just because of the nature of uh, the way that ambient occlusion maps are made. So um, probably shouldn't have mentioned ambient occlusion maps at all. Okay, now it is done, but we are not seeing it yet until we turn on model textures. All right, there we go. <laughs> yeah, that looks pretty good. So this almost looks indistinguishable from the 40 million polygon. It's thundering outside. I'm not sure if the microphone's picking that up. Uh, but this almost looks indistinguishable just because of the quality of the texture is so high that it just looks amazing. We're going to do one more texture. And that is the normal map. And then we'll send this out to another program to see what it looks like in something else. So, uh, okay, let's go ahead and bake out the normal map. So we just go to workflow, build texture. And now this time we don't use images. We actually have to use the high poly model, which is the first one here. It says 40 million high quality. We select that. We have keep UVs. Oh, I forgot to change this to normal map. Change that to normal map, and then we're going to sit, just say OK. Now it's baking the map at an 8K texture resolution, which is really, really high. Um, you know, I you don't have to do that. You could always reduce it later, but uh, you know, it's uh, you know, if you can, why not? So uh, we just have to wait for a few minutes, and then this will bake out, and then we'll get our model out of this program and into a different program. Okay, the normal map is done. We can go into here and you can see you can check normal map and it'll show that visually. So this is what the normal map will look like. Oh, it looks like it got a little hole there. I didn't notice that before. I wonder if that's in the original. That might be a spot that I just didn't get a camera angle at, um, which would cause that. Yeah, didn't see that before, but you know, it's something you could patch up. So, Let's turn it back to the diffuse map because it looks nicer. Okay, I'm going to do a last step here, and I'm actually going to see if I could just close this hole up here. So we'll go ahead and go Tools, Mesh, and Close Hole. And it's going to analyze the mesh, and it might find that second hole that I just saw as well. So let's go ahead and see. Well, we're just going to hit OK and let it do its magic and yeah it found both holes so it patched up this little hole so there is geo there and it patched at the bottom so now we have uh geo there we don't have to worry about that we can we would have to lay out uvs on it um and wow that is really something <laughs> not the patch job i would have done but uh i guess it works Okay, because I didn't like the way Agisoft filled the holes, all I did was I went and I backstepped. I, you, know, you can go edit, undo. And uh, Agisoft doesn't always let you undo everything, but it did let me undo that step of closing the holes. So now I got rid of them, and I'll have to find a different way to close up the hole so that it's not so high poly. Um, but let's go ahead and export this out. So we'll go export, export model. And uh, I'll go ahead and just write it over this. Say save. Say yes, replace it. And then I'll change. It's going to export the textures for me automatically. And I'll change it to PNG. I prefer PNGs. Oh, 
All right, so now I'm in a program called Marmoset Toolbag. I use this, uh, use this as a visualizer. Uh, basically, you can just bring in 3D models. It's really good for real-time viewing. So let's go ahead and import that model. So I could just say open or import model. Let's say import model because we don't have a scene yet. So I'll just go ahead and grab this boss relief, open it. And it's going to try to take in the original uh, textures that were on there. Let me turn this over because I think this is facing upwards. And it's going to try to take the original textures and make a material here. I don't want one of the materials coming in. I'm going to go ahead and throw on this default material and just delete that. And actually, I can get rid of that too. And then I'll just go ahead and add in the color map. So here's the color map open. And then I'll add in the normal map, and here's the normal map. Okay, so now let me also add in a light, and we'll go ahead and just turn the light off to the side a little bit like this. Maybe pull it back, open up the spot angle a little bit, change the brightness, change the distance. So we get a little fall off there. And bada bing, there it's looking good. Okay, now I just wanna look at this really quick. It looks shiny uh, because I have to turn the roughness up a little bit if I wanna get rid of that shine. Um, but I just wanna show you how much this normal map really does. So if I hide the normal map, you can see like that normal map is basically, it's like a make or break for this object. It only has 20,000 faces in it, but it looks like a lot more just because of the normal map. You know, the last step would be, since I didn't like the patching that uh, AggieSoft did, I'd probably take it into ZBrush or some other program, could be Blender, could be Maya, whatever, and just patch up those holes really quick, give them some UVs, put that little texture on the back of it. Um, that's kind of getting into the more advanced uh, 100 to 200 level. So we're going to hold off on that one for this first run through. This is just a, a nice intro going from knowing nothing about photogrammetry to, you know, knowing a whole bunch. Even if you didn't have the kind of camera that I have, uh, you could still take most of the principles and apply them. The only thing that wouldn't matter would be all the stuff that I showed you with the camera. But if you go ahead and get a different camera, um, a lot of the settings you should be able to set up similarly in any other camera. Most cameras have most of those settings and at least the like more advanced cameras would. Um, so that's uh, still applicable in that sense. And uh, I actually had a blast making this. It was a lot of fun. Uh, be looking forward to 100 to 200, where we'll go into some more advanced topics and uh, get into the ring flash and uh, turntables and that kind of stuff. So this should give you a good start in photogrammetry. And now you should be able to go out and just start trying to play around and get some interesting uh, work going on. And, uh, come back and watch the later ones that I'm going to make because there'll be more advanced topics and it'll just bring you up to the next level. All right, that's it for this one. I'm Dan Triplett. Thank you for watching this and have a great day. There's like a super annoying fly that won't leave me alone. I'll kill you. I will kill you. I have a paintbrush, don't make me use it. That's my fly swatter.